Yerushalayim, a Hebrew word of magnificent significance. We English speakers know it as Jerusalem. What is its significance as a, as a word and a, a city to you? Perhaps you've been to the earthly city of Yerushalayim, halfway across the globe from Orange County, California. Just curious, anyone been there? You can raise your hand. Okay, we have a few who've been to this great city. I have not been there, but if the Lord wills, I'd like to make my way there before the Lord takes me home to the heavenly Jerusalem. Many have noted the meaning of Jerusalem is the city of peace. It's also identified as possession of peace or complete awe. The first part, yeru, means to to see or to be in awe of. And then the second part, shalayim or shalom, is widely recognized as peace or wholeness. And the geographical location of Jerusalem, although not yet called Jerusalem at that time, first appears in the Bible in Genesis 14, when Abram meets the king of Salem, Melchizedek, a figure we studied earlier on in the book of Hebrews. And then the first mention of Jerusalem, literally that that word, Yerusalem, is in Joshua chapter 10, verse 3. And the locale of Jerusalem hosts some pretty significant historical events in the Old Testament narrative. The most prominent of such being when Abraham is ready to slaughter his son as a sacrifice, trusting that the Lord will raise him from the dead. That happened at Mount Moriah, located in Jerusalem. And later in biblical history, King David takes the hill, conquering the Jebusites, and establishes Jerusalem as the capital city for Israel. It's the same place David's son, Solomon, builds the first temple where God dwells in the midst of his people. And in the year 586 BC, a Babylonian king, King Nebuchadnezzar, ransacks the city and exiles many of the Jews away from Jerusalem to a foreign land. And after 70 years of exile, some Jews returned to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the temple and also the city walls. We could list a lot of history, more history, in this important city. Suffice to say that the city still stands today with ancient artifacts in its boundaries. I'm thinking of the Western Wall, which was a part of the the retaining wall surrounding the Temple Mount in biblical times. The city of Jerusalem also has other noteworthy names. Within Scripture, you may know some of those names, various descriptions. Ariel, the city of David, the city of God, faithful city are amongst its names. And one such significant alternative name is Zion. I'm sure you've heard of it. Zion. Psalm 87 verses 2 and 3 says this, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Selah. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Zion is not just some concept of the past though. Yes, as I've tried to briefly demonstrate just now, it's played an indispensable role in the history of Israel. But it also plays a massively significant role for God's people in the present and in the future. There are a lot of different notions about quote-unquote Zionism these days, even in the broader culture, especially because of what happened just five months ago on October 7th. There have been many critiques of Zionism by antagonistic voices. Now, just for qualification, theologically, I do not hold to a particular view of what a good amount of American Christians hold to regarding present-day Israel and Jerusalem. 
I'll touch upon my view a little bit later in the sermon, but I am for the right of present-day Israel to defend itself as citizens of a nation's state. What was done to Israel five months back was pure evil, but I digress. My point here is Zion is significant for God's people. And our understanding of Zion actually plays a role in helping us to finish the race as disciples of Christ. That is to say, what you think about Zion, what you think about Zion will contribute to your faithfulness to run the race that you have been enlisted to here and now. Do you have a biblical understanding of Mount Zion? Do you realize that in Christ... As the author of Hebrews says, you have come to Zion. In order to kind of explore this concept more, let us open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. If you haven't done so already, I'd invite you to open there in your copy of the scriptures. We are in the home stretch. After today, we only have one more chapter before we complete the sermon letter of Hebrews. And so the end is in sight, and there is light at the end of the tunnel. And by now, you know the original audience of Hebrews had a robust working knowledge of the Old Testament. Of course, the the book itself is Hebrews, and Hebrews favored and studied the Old Testament scriptures. Well, the problem was, for them, their knowledge of the Old Testament did not lead them to Christ, Their knowledge of the Old Testament was incomplete and insufficient. Thus, the author spends the whole book from beginning to end instructing them on how all of the Old Testament institutions, how they prefigured Christ and how they were fulfilled in him. Throughout the chapters, the latter chapters, chapters 11 and 12, the author has been trying to help them be faithful in the present as they look forward. And he's used the analogy of a race. And in particular, last week, we emphasized how the community of God, it serves as a a vital role in helping runners finish this race. And today, in these final verses of chapter 12, the author explains why they must not quit their race. It has to do with Zion, with Jerusalem. So here's the take-home point. Pay attention to and obey God's word because he has already brought you to the heavenly place. Pay attention to and obey God's word because he has already brought you to the heavenly place. So how I want to look at this is by way of two, uh, out, two parts of an outline. The first part is this. Zion is here. Zion is here in verses 18 through 24. And then number two, listen to God's voice in verses 25 to 29. You can see that outline on the back of your bulletin. Number one, Zion is here. And number two, listen to God's voice. So first, Zion is here. Now the first seven verses of this section are pretty much a a compare and contrast between two significant places in Hebrew history. The author knows his audience is familiar with these two places and these two concepts, so much so that he doesn't even mention the first one by name. The places are Sinai versus Zion. Sinai versus Zion, two famous mountainous places within Israel's history. And Sinai, as probably most of you know, was a mountain where Israel received God's law via Moses. And then Zion, on the other hand, or Jerusalem, also was on an elevated mountain. And as the author sets contrast between the two mountains, he assumes the background and the history. Now, I'm guessing most of us know the background of Sinai, but just in case not, here's a little review. Israel is delivered out of the hand of Egypt and Pharaoh, and then the Lord leads them to Mount Sinai, where he calls 
Moses, just Moses, to go atop to the peak of Sinai to receive God's revelation. And Moses receives God's word at this mountaintop. And while he's there, the people below, they're at the foot of the mountain, and it's a prolonged amount of time. And in Moses' absence, they begin to fret and become anxious, and they construct a false god at the hand of Aaron. And this event as a whole is what the the Hebrews author has in mind in verses 18 through 21. You can look there for yourself. It says there in chapter 12, verse 18, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now, when Israel arrived at this desert mountain, the Lord warned the people not to even touch it. It was physically touchable, but they weren't permitted to touch it. The whole scene was of terror. You can look back on your own in Exodus 19 to get a feel for that whole scene. It was loud. It was was so loud that the people pleaded for God not to speak to them directly. Maybe we can or cannot imagine a scene like this. For me, it was when I was a young kid living at 320 Grenion Court in the Bay Area. And I just remember one night during a storm that the thunder was so ferocious And I was sitting in my bedroom, cowering over the audible booms as if they were just screaming directly over my head. It was quite fearful. At Sinai, the experience as a whole was enough to frighten Moses, the very man, Scripture says, who spoke to the Lord face to face. And after finding out about the golden calves at the base camp, Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 9, Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before, 40 days and 40 nights, for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure that the Lord bore against you so that he was ready to destroy you. Indeed, it was a dangerous scene at Sinai. Moses and the people were in their right minds to respond in utter trepidation. The author is very intentional through his recall of Sinai. He's reminding the audience that Sinai was of the past. Well, something new, something better on the other hand has come. Now, Jesus has ushered his people into Zion. And the contrast to Sinai cannot be more clear from verse 22. Look with me in this verse. It says, But you have come to Mount Zion, Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, there's a lot in there. But what I want you to notice right off the bat is the difference in aura between these two different mounts. One is strictly of fear, Sinai. The other, Mount Zion, infuses joy and delight. Now, I don't think fear is completely absent because later in verse 29, God is described as a consuming fire. Well, the difference is there is both joy and fear, a healthy fear. And the heavenly Jerusalem emits a a palpable joy for those who are there. This heavenly Jerusalem is, is one of celebration and delight. And what we have in this heavenly scene of those who have trusted in Jesus and and, and, and given their lives to him, they, they receive all of these benefits from him. They're amongst angels, Mary in their hearts. It's an assembly of the firstborn, which is an allusion to those who have received a a great and magnificent inheritance from their heavenly Father. All who are in Christ by faith, 
in a sense, are firstborn, the firstborn in that they receive the utter privileges of what would have been reserved for only one person on the earthly ancient Near Eastern family. Jesus, the son, receives an inheritance from his father based on his obedience to him. And then that son shares it with those who believe in him. God, the judge of all, has judged in Christ. And that last phrase in verse 23, the the spirits of the righteous made perfect, that's probably a reference to the Old Testament saints of Hebrews 11 who were perfected upon completing the race that they were running. And then finally in verse 24, we're we're reminded of this Jesus who has secured the heavenly Jerusalem for his people as he functions as a mediator, as a high priest in this new covenant that he has begun. And his blood, the text says, surpasses Abel's blood because Abel's blood testified to his faith, but Jesus' blood actually effectively purifies his people. Abel's blood didn't do that. It was just kind of testimonial. Again, you have that author's favorite word in verse 24, the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Everything about Jesus is better. And the contrast between these two mountains is unmistakable. You can't miss it. Mount Zion is the place to be. And the sermon letter of Hebrews reminds God's people that they have come to Mount Zion. In other words, Mount Zion is here. Verse 22, but you have come come to Mount Zion. Now, what's the author saying here? The author, uh, the, the, the Hebrews, the, the audience, and, and by way of extension, us, we, the, the new covenant community, we experience Zion in the here and now, right now, where we are. In other words, you don't have to go to Jerusalem, the earthly city, 7,500 plus miles away from here in Anaheim, you don't have to go there in order to experience God's holy and joyous presence. Mount Zion is right here, right now. As the people of God gather together for worship, specifically on the Lord's day, we become a heavenly sanctuary where God can be seen on earth. And the Old Covenant... God was seen at one place for most of Israel's history in the earthly Jerusalem at the temple. Now, beloved, in our gathering, we are the temple of God. First Baptist Church of Anaheim, one mile east of here, is the temple of God. Zion is there as Pastor Victor and friends gather to worship in the name of Christ with the dwelling of the Holy Spirit among them. Local churches who preach a biblically faithful gospel are like heaven on earth. We are, in the words of Jonathan Lehman, kingdom embassies where God's intimate presence can actually be experienced and observed. In our gathering, we are the better sanctuary. That's why he says in verse 22, you have come. Not, you will come. He says, you have come. And in a partial kind of way, the better homeland, the city with foundations, the better country that Abraham was looking for in Hebrews 11, it's realized temporarily here on earth when God's people gather to worship him. Now, what is an embassy? Jonathan Lehman correctly describes it as an officially sanctioned outpost of one nation inside the borders of another nation. Let me repeat that definition. It's a, an embassy is an officially sanctioned outpost of one nation inside the borders of another nation. And when I spent a summer in China way back in 2004 as a part of a short-term summer missions, uh, missions team, our team was stationed in Xi'an, but we visited Beijing, the capital of China. And when we were in Beijing, we entered into the building of the U.S. Embassy. And as we stepped into that building, with passports in hand required for entry, 
we actually were stepping onto U.S. soil. A Marine was stationed there. We did not see Chinese citizens in that building. Everyone was a U.S. citizen. It's kind of remarkable. I was able to step onto American ground while in a foreign land. That is what local churches are. They are an outpost of Mount Zion in a foreign land. We don't have to go to the earthly Jerusalem to actually be in Jerusalem. This local church is an outpost of Mount Zion right here, right now. Spiritually speaking, when the church gathers together, 412 East Broadway in Anaheim, Orange County becomes an outpost of Mount Zion. Now, with that said, it's also worth noting the final fulfillment of Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, has not yet arrived. It will come in full in the new heavens and the new earth. And it is in Revelation 21 through 22 when Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, will come in whole. Thus, our experience of Mount Zion is already, but not yet. Now, if what I'm saying is true, if it's faithful to the biblical text, what are the spiritual ramifications for believers here and now? What does it mean for you and I as disciples of Jesus who meet regularly? A text like this indeed assures us that as we pray, as we sing, As God's word is preached, as we partake of holy ordinances like baptism and the Lord's Supper, as we do all these things, we are joining in the heavenly realm along with angels and previous runners who have gone before us. We're joining them in a heavenly liturgy of worship, exalting the one true and living God. You know, Sinai, it says, was was touchable, so to speak. It was physical, In our weekly worship, we engage in a unique spiritual moment alongside participants we cannot see with the naked eye. Whether you're more conscious or less conscious of it, your soul is worshiping alongside a a heavenly realm. This is exactly why we mustn't take for granted coming to Mount Zion. It has to be in the forefront of our minds that we are engaging God himself with the entirety of the heavenly realm. We are drawn up to heaven in the here and now. Does that amaze you? I hope it does. Thus, we cannot come casually or we mustn't come flippantly. It is right to prepare ourselves for this day. It is good to ready our souls in anticipation. Also, we come with joy. Coming to this place as a member of this church signifies that we indeed have the mediator we need whose blood has effectively covered over us. It surpasses Abel's blood in speaking the final word of forgiveness over us. Be happy, friends. If you've trusted in Christ, you are forgiven of your sins Literally, in the, in the context of a fallen world, there is no better word you can hear from the mouth of God, forgiven. And at this Mount Zion, we need to constantly remind one another of such a truth. Have you recently told another brother or sister in the Lord that they are indeed forgiven? Say it today. Encourage one another today. And it's especially at Mount Zion where we must have an awareness of our forgiveness in Christ. Oh, how good it is indeed. Earlier I mentioned I'd briefly state my position on Zion and Israel as it relates to present Jerusalem. I kind of have already. But before we move on to the second header, let me briefly outline my position on so-called Zionism. And I know that word means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. There's a prominent teaching today within Christian circles that this earthly Jerusalem, 7,500 plus miles away, is still uniquely a holy place, or it will be again in the future where a new physical temple will again be reestablished. And in this view, 
Zion will eventually again host animal sacrifices at the temple in the millennial kingdom where Christ will reign for 1,000 years. Because God's promise to Abraham that his descendants would dwell in the land God had given him, because of that promise still stands in literal fulfillment, Zion will be reestablished, physical Zion. Many Christians see the reestablishment of Israel as a nation state in 1948 as a fulfillment of such promises made to Abraham. While, again, I do support Israel's right to existence, I do not think that the reconstitution of Israel with Jerusalem as the capital was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. I know in this room that might sound shocking. The land promises made to Abraham are fulfilled in Christ. And verses like Hebrews 12, 22 help us to see such is the case. The earthly Zion was a place for God's people to prepare for a coming Messiah. And the heavenly Zion will be part of a new creation where the redeemed of all time, Jew and Gentile, united as one people of God who trust in Christ, will dwell together in the presence of God. Therefore, while the events happening in modern-day Israel are of massive importance because of how nations, states, must protect their citizens, I do not subscribe to any particular theological significance to the land or the city in of itself. Again, you have come to Mount Zion because God's people have come to Mount Zion now We must listen to and obey God's voice. If you're taking notes, this is the point in time where we move our way to the second portion of the second header of this sermon. Listen to and obey God's voice. Look at verse 25. He says there, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Again, we have the the contrast between mountain of Sinai and the mountain of the heavenly Zion. God has spoken from both mountaintops. And we've already looked at the reaction God's voice elicited when he spoke from that first mountain, Mount Sinai. God delivered the whole law atop Sinai, calling upon his people to follow and obey him. And the warning given from that earthly mountain was a curse of judgment to be cast out of the promised land if the people failed to trust his word and obey. If you want to go and look at that in more detail, the the curse itself, you go to a text like Leviticus 26 or Deuteronomy 28 and look at some of the curses for failing to heed God's warning. The warnings there in those chapters aren't just a a slap on the wrist. We know the history of Israel, that she indeed was exiled from Canaan, from the promised land. And in her history, Israel faced a punishment where dead bodies were left on the streets of Jerusalem. And if that was a hefty warning delivered atop the earthly Sinai, how much more weighty is the warning given from God who speaks to the Hebrews from his heavenly Zion? And his warning is of an eternal judgment, judgment for rejecting him. And the comparison between Sinai and the heavenly Mount Zion extends to the the very shaking of each mount. Look at verse 26 and 27 with me. The text says, At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, "Yet, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens, This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. What is he saying here? Sinai shook violently. A day is coming, a day is approaching, where that shaking will look like a small tap. The shaking will cause all other unsteady things to crumble, this new, this greater shaking. Only Christ's kingdom will stand in this second shaking. 
And that the day God's voice will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And, and this is something to be feared. It is the day he returns from heaven to earth in order to sift through what is eternal and what is temporary. The things that do not matter, the kingdoms with shaky foundations, will be exposed on that day. And on that day, you want to make sure your citizenship belongs to his kingdom. And in light of that future day, he calls us to heed his voice now. Again, verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And to refuse the God who is speaking is to refuse his son. You remember the first words of this sermon epistle? If you want, you don't have to, but if you want to, you can turn back to the first sentence of this entire book. Hebrews 1 verses 1 through 2 says, Long ago... At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Again, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. The Lord speaks through his son, Jesus Jesus the Christ. And this message falls in line with what the entire letter has been getting at. Do not reject Jesus. It's vital to note here, the author of, the author of Christ is not something just to consider. In a consideration, a person weighs back and forth a given decision with whatever they are deciding between. Let me consider if I want to stay for lunch at church or if I want to go off campus to eat. Let me consider if I want to hang out with church friends or go home after church and take a Sunday nap. These are considerations. On the contrary, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking stands as a command. It stands as an imperative. My seminary president, Dr. Albert Moeller, notes that whether it be a product of our modern culture or it be general casualness towards the biblical text, it's really easy to present the gospel to unbelievers as a, as a consideration rather than a command. We don't present it in such a way where our hearers hear the urgency of the message. When we share the gospel, if we share the gospel, oftentimes we present its contents, God as creator, man as rebels, the cross, Jesus on the cross as our substitute, and then Jesus' victory over death as God's declaration of victory over sin. And then in general terms, we talk about repentance and faith. Sometimes we don't even mention that last part, though. I wonder if if we ever say, God is urgently calling you to repent of your sin and trust in his Son. Don't refuse, don't reject him who is speaking to you. Again, the the content of the gospel is, is shared sometimes in a, you know, this is what I believe kind of fashion. What do you believe? It's an interchanging of ideas, and I get there's a context for that. But oftentimes it's not so much God has this demand on your soul. Believe and, and submit to his son. And I believe this is why I was taught in my personal evangelism seminary class by Dr. Timothy Booker. He says that whenever you present the gospel, make a call to a person you're sharing with. He teaches us, he taught us to put people in a position to actively accept or reject the truth claim that you've just made. The reason for this is, again, because the nature of God speaking to humans is not neutral. It's easy for people to think that it's neutral because it puts them in a a less of an awkward position as the person sharing the gospel, but it's not neutral. It demands a response. You can either accept it or reject it. You cannot stay in the middle when God speaks to you. And if that's the case, and you're here today having not yet received Jesus by turning away from your sin and trusting that he paid the penalty for your sins on the cross, which led to his resurrection from the dead, I ask you, what is, what is holding you back? What is holding you back from turning away from your sins and putting your faith in Jesus? 
to be indifferent to what Jesus has done for you or to fail to respond to him positively is indeed to reject him. Are you ready to take the significant step of giving your life to him in faith? Are you ready for that? Reject him no longer, friend. If you trust in him, he will make you a part of his kingdom that cannot be shaken. Well, for us Christians who've already professed Christ, the call to not refuse him who speaks is a call to keep on chugging on in the race. We are a part of the kingdom God has established, a kingdom that he will eventually solidify on the final day. And it is our responsibility to watch out for the deterrence that may prevent us from finishing our race. And when the Lord speaks, he's granting us the means to help us finish the race that we've been enlisted into. How is it, practically speaking, that we, quote-unquote, do not refuse him who is speaking? Well, in the mind of the Hebrew author, I think it's paying attention to what is taught in the local church context. And the reason I say that is because later on in the sermon epistle, he says so explicitly. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and verse 17. Look with me a few verses down from where we are right now. He says in verse 7 of chapter 13, Remember your leaders who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their faith and imitate their faith. Verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, I will have an opportunity, Lord willing, to more specifically elaborate on verse 7 and 17 in a couple of sermons, Lord, again, Lord willing, when those verses are the sermon text. However, it will suffice to say right now, the position of the preacher is the one speaking on behalf of God. And as I, the the regular preacher for this congregation, attempt to expound the biblical text, We are called to listen and to not reject what is said. Obviously, the preacher, as a a flawed and sinful man, can and will sometimes get things wrong. That's where it will be up to the congregation to sift through the scriptures like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 who examined the text to see if what Paul said was true. Yes, that's that's a qualification indeed. However, the overall point is Remember and do what is said from the pulpit. This might be a little awkward and sound self-promoting coming from me, but, but here's a question for you. What do you find yourself doing more when you hear me from this pulpit? Questioning what I'm saying or listening to it and, and following it? Irrespective of whether you like my style or not, do you deal with the content of what is said? I do not expect that everyone will jive with how I say things or will enjoy my meat and potatoes style. Regardless, you are accountable to God for how you respond just as much as I am accountable to God for what I say. Therefore, we need to take the word of God seriously. You have come to Zion. Therefore, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Furthermore, as one who has come to Zion, we're instructed to give thanks and worship. Look there in verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Two of the ways you know you're heeding God's voice is if you give thanks and if you worship. Of course, there's overlap between being grateful and offering worship unto the Lord. Within the context of what is written in these verses, I think it's giving thanks for God withholding from you what you deserve. He's talking about kingdoms breaking, kingdoms crumbling, all kingdoms that stand apart from the kingdom of Christ. 
And he has brought you into his heavenly kingdom. And you belong to a kingdom where money cannot pay for its citizenship. Entrance into this kingdom cannot be earned by good deeds. If you are in Christ, you have been transported onto the winning team. In basketball terms, it's kind of like Jeremy Lin. He became an NBA championship in 2019 after signing as a free agent and having barely played a minute on the Toronto Raptors in the finals. But unlike Jeremy Lin, who is embarrassed that he didn't earn his championship status, we don't have to look at our kingdom citizenship with shame because we could never earn it. Complete acceptance and a, a sure foundation has been guaranteed us without us even lifting a finger. And if we try to lift a finger to obtain citizenship, we actually show we are not fit for this kingdom. Therefore, gratitude is the fruit of someone who understands grace. And so is worship. The text says we are to worship with reverence and and awe. God, as the one who is a consuming fire, has granted us access into his holy presence. He has granted us entrance into coming to Mount Zion. And his presence could kill us, but we are spared and and able to enjoy his presence because Christ protects us by way of his sacrifice. And in Christ, we receive divine mercy, not only to come into God's fearful presence, but we receive divine mercy to enjoy his presence. And only in Christ can we come before the Lord in joyful fear and fearful joy. Therefore, Every time we come to Mount Zion, Jerusalem, in the here and now, let us remember how Christ has transformed our coming from straight fear at Sinai to now joy and awe. It is no small thing that you are here today. Hear his voice, give thanks, and worship him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for enabling us in Christ to come to the new Mount Zion. And it's here, Father, where we are able to experience your presence uniquely on this earth. And what a joy it is to come alongside our brothers and sisters to worship you, the one true and living God. Grant us joy in our hearts cultivate a joyful, a fearful joy and also a joyful fear because you have spared us and declared us forgiven and you call us to pursue you in the race, to continue running after you. So let us continue running in steadfastness, continue to arm us and equip us with everything we need to finish our race. Lord, we also thank you for the opportunity to worship you, not just through song, not just through prayers, not just through the preaching of your word, but also through offering. So we pray that you would grant us worshipful, thankful, and joyful hearts, even as we give unto you. Would you bless the giving of your people and use the the resources of this church to spread the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.